I would like to read with you in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4, and we will read at verse number 3. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That is all we will read. You've joined us in the past uh, number of nights, as many of you have, and we thank you for coming back. You will have heard terms uh, expressed when it comes to the gospel message itself, that it is an amazing message, a message, really the greatest message that a person could hear, uh, a wonderful message, things like this that have been said. And a question that some people might have is, if the gospel is so wonderful, if it is so powerful, if it is so amazing, why does it seem to have such little impact on society around us, on a society that is continually uh, crumbling even around us? Uh, my first question to that, without going into a history, history lesson, would be that the, any benefit we have in the United States of America today is, I think it would be without exaggeration, a direct, uh, a direct impact from the uh, gospel being preached in this country. And from people who have come over, even in this East Coast, men like George Whitfield and others who have come and preached, perhaps even here in New Jersey, many, many times. And any of the benefits and blessings and uh, stances that are taken are not because the gospel has not had a big impact. And yet today, in our day, in our day that some people term the day of small things, in our day that some people term the day that is on the decline, a day where everything is a little bit sad and shallow and 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 and, and uh, cloudy why is it and i think what we have read here tonight is the answer this is what paul says is the answer he says if the gospel is not being accepted if it's not being appreciated by others it says this now listen to what he's saying because i don't want you to think it's my opinion or the opinion of any church listen to what he says if our gospel is hidden it is hidden to them that are lost in whom the god of this world that's that's the devil the God of this world, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. So the reason, the reason why the gospel has made little impact in, in some areas is because the devil has blinded the minds. You know, tonight, if you, if you have not welcomed the gospel, if you have not accepted the Lord Jesus, it is because, according to this verse, you're blind. You're blind. And it is in this context that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5 says, So, or because, we will not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as the Lord. What is he meaning? That's, again, coming to our word, that word preach. Why is he saying we won't preach ourselves? Sure, it will be more entertaining, perhaps, for us to preach ourselves, for us to tell you our stories. And, and, and many things that maybe we have experienced in our lives. Why does Paul says we? Why does Paul say we will not preach ourselves? You know why? Because to open the eyes of the blind. That's why. That, that's what's at stake in a gospel meeting. People who have assembled here tonight spiritually are blind. They have never seen before, and we have no power. And there's nothing in ourselves at all that could ever open the eyes of someone who is blind. And so he says instead. We preach Christ Jesus as the Lord, a sovereign, strong, mighty to open the eyes of the blind. And so we're going to look at that tonight. The reason, my friend, why the gospel has never resonated, why it has never deeply affected your life, because you're blind. blind. I want to look at it very simply, just in the opening part of this meeting. I want you to notice who keeps people blind. Secondly, how he keeps them blind. And then lastly, who can give them sight, which is what we want to happen and what we believe can happen in this gospel meeting tonight. Yes, this little meeting in Wyckoff, New Jersey. Do you know what can happen? Oh, you say they'll just assemble there. They'll sing a few songs. They'll listen to a few messages. No. What can happen in this meeting can receive their sight. 
That's what can happen right here in this tent tonight. You know, there's amazing touching videos uh, circulating on uh, YouTube today with some of the technology advancements with, uh, you know, medicine of people who are partially blind or even mostly blind. And they put on these, you know, things on their eyes. And for the first time, they sit across from their spouse or across from their daughter. And as they put the eye drops in and put the thing over their eyes for the first time, they get to see. You ever seen one of those? It's extremely touching just to see an old father, maybe in his 50s, never seen his daughter. And now she's grown up to be a 20 some year old girl. And as the little machine is put on his eyes and as he opens them through that machine and looks at her, everyone in the room is crying and those eyes begin to leak as well. You know why? Because that man through a very blurred medium finally gets to see. That's why when people are saved, that's why there is sometimes great emotion and great welcome because it's even bigger than that. My friend, people in this tent tonight can go from darkness to light. And even though there's not as many here tonight as perhaps uh, in other nights, you know, the Lord Jesus, an amazing uh, instance took place in the city of Jericho. Blind man received his sight. Bartimaeus, one man. And tonight, perhaps there's just one blind young man here tonight or blind young lady. And tonight could be your night in this city of Wyckoff, New Jersey, in which you receive your sin. May it be. Listen tonight as to what this has to say. Who keeps us blind? Well, it says right here. It says the God of this world. It's a term that refers to the devil. He is not God overall. As another term that refers the Bible uh, terms about the one true God, the sovereign of the universe. But he is called the God of this world. The one who is in power, the one who, whose world system is under his sway. He's the God of this world. And notice what it says he, he does. It says that, you know, <clears throat> we were talking just the other day about a very old debate in church history about really the subject is who can really be saved. You know, and people uh, try to parse through Ephesians 1, and John 10, and other passages like that, Romans 9, and try to figure out who can be saved. And, some people have decided that there's certain people who can't be saved. You know, the devil thinks that everyone can be saved. That's what it says here. It says he blinds them lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine in their hearts. The devil believes that you could be saved. Did you know that? Maybe you don't believe that. Maybe even other people around don't believe that, but the devil believes that. And more importantly, God believes it. You could be saved tonight. He keeps them blind as the God of this world. He puts blinders over their eyes. So that's why when we talk to people, they say, I just can't see it. I can't see that I'm that bad a person. I just can't see that I deserve to like go to hell for lying. I have never lived a life like Adolf Hitler or like Saddam Hussein or like any terrorist or any great murderer or rapist. I have lived a very clean life. Yes, maybe I've lied and cheated and maybe, but who hasn't? Who hasn't? And they say, I just can't see it. No, you can't. You're blind. You're blind. That's why you can't see it. You're blind. And it's the devil who blinds people and tells them, you're not that bad. You're, you, you're just fine. You're okay. He's the one who keeps people blind. And that's why even in meetings like this, it's something we don't really like to think about, but we must think of it. But there is a power in gospel meetings that takes place. The, the Lord Jesus himself said, that a sower went forth to sow. And as the seed fell on the ground, this is what his words were. Then cometh the devil. Then cometh the devil. There is an enemy tonight, an enemy of your soul. He would love to have you with him where he will be forever in hell. Not because he has any love for you, but he hates God. Hates any worship that will ever be given to God. It's the first thing you'll do if you're saved. First thing you'll do is you'll say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And he hates that. And he will do everything to keep you blind. Notice where he blinds you. Blinded the minds. That's why so many people, even my own uh, conversion story, if I were to tell you how I was saved, I would tell you that I sat in gospel meetings and instantly I was 100 miles away. Distracted. Distracted where? In the mind. Yes, I would come. Yes, I perfected the art of looking at the preacher, of pretending like I was with him, but 100 miles away, wherever I wanted to be. You see, that's what happens. The mind gets distracted. The mind gets taken up with so many other things. You know, it was Peter Orison, 
uh, a man that I knew very, very little, but appreciated very, very much. He told the story one day of a painting that people came to visit. Maybe you've heard this story here, but I find it extremely powerful. And it was the painting of a woman holding a baby. And, and, and you know how the painters can almost get them to show like motion nearly. Um, and it looked like that woman was rocking the baby. And different critics came through the museum to look at that painting. And a lot of them, they thought it was a good painting. There's a woman holding her baby. They gave it a, a good rating. Some of them, you know, were a little bit more critical. They said that, uh, well, some of the brush strokes are a little bit off and other things look a little bit off, but really all in all, it's a nice painting of, of a mother and a child. But there was one critic who didn't like the painting. He said, there's something off about that painting. He said, in the eyes of that mother, there seems to be an evil intent. The way she's looking at that baby as she rocks him seems to be looking at that baby with seductive, evil desire. Just, just, just portrayed in the eyes of that woman. And the artist who was there was ecstatic when she said that. And he ran over to the painting and lifted off the inscription. You know what it said? The whole world lies in the arms of the wicked man. That's what it said. It was a painting where the painter had depicted the devil as a sweet, rocking mother, keeping people blind, blind. Friend tonight, if you're not saved, you've been blinded by the devil in darkness tonight in this gospel meeting to one day end up in outer darkness forever, forever, blind. And listen, if there's anyone here tonight and you don't have the real thing and you're putting on something just to appease the Christians, I did that myself when I was like eight years old. Listen, it's a real thing to have the blinders removed and be truly saved and be able to see the consequences of the gospel is not pleasing mom or not pleasing her or pleasing the Christians or not pleasing them. It's heaven or hell forever, forever. And he blinds people, blinds people with whatever you need. You need a little bit of sports to distract you, you'll have it. You need a promotion at work, you'll have it. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes a relationship. How many gospel series have been conducted where a person seems very interested and then a relationship comes and they're gone. Never see him again. Why? Then cometh the devil, blinding people. Friend, tonight you're blinded. How he keeps them blind. Bringing me to my second point. We've already touched on the fact that he blinds their minds. But I want you to notice this. This is very important. Some people think, well, are people like human beings, like you, you, you people here, are we just innocent, tragic victims of the devil? And he just blinds us and we have no choice in the matter and we're just blinded and that's just the way it is. You notice who he blinds? Did you notice that? Second Corinthians 4. It doesn't say he blinds the mind of sinners. It didn't say it. It doesn't say he blinds the minds of the ungodly. It says he blinds the minds of them which believe not. See, my friend, you have a part to play in the whole matter. Your unbelief opens you up to the blinding of Satan. That's how he blinded the people in the first place. Half God said, half God said, the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. And they chose to not believe God and believe the lie of the devil. Blind. People in this meeting tonight, the reason you're blinded is because of your own. Yes, you are born in sin, naturally blinded to God. But this type of blinding is because of your unbelief. What do you refuse to believe? You refuse to believe the gospel. You refuse to believe who you actually are in the sight of God. You refuse to believe what Christ has done. He blinds the eyes, the minds, excuse me. He blinds the minds of them which believe not. See, that's why unbelief is such a serious sin. That's why at the end of the Bible in Revelation, it says the people who will be in the lake of fire, it says unbelievers, fearful, right in the list of whoremongers, murderers, adulterers, un unbelief. That's what the devil uses to put the blinders on. You listen to the gospel and they say you're a sinner. 
You're guilty before God, even if it's of lying, and your lying will be judged according to the Bible. All liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire. You're hearing it from the Bible. You know what you say? It can't be that bad. And the devil says, you're right. You're right. Keep the blinders on. Keep the blinders on. All's good. Keep distracted. You'll have lots more time. There's people in this tent tonight. Totally blind. Of the devil, and so because of unbelief, he keeps us blind. But that brings me now to my last point who can give sight? Notice what it says here we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. You know, if you're going to be removed from that state of being blinded, if the blinders are going to be taken off of your eyes, you need somebody stronger than the devil. Friends tonight, are you stronger than the devil? You know any church who's stronger than the devil? You know any religious right that's stronger than the devil? I'll tell you somebody who's stronger than the devil. The seed of the woman who crushed his head. That's what it says in the Bible. First promise in the Bible. The seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. That's what happened on the cross. Wasn't a tragic story. Wasn't a great defeat. On the cross went a mighty warrior, our Lord Jesus Christ, and he crushed the head of the serpent. He crushed him. Yes, he received a wound in his feet, but the devil received a mortal wound, defeated. I rejoice preaching about that. He's been destroyed, defeated. His end is, his end is sure. And so that's why the Lord can give people who are blinded here tonight, blinded by the devil. That's why he can give you sight. He's defeated the power of the enemy. He's defeated the power of the devil, and he can give you sight. And that brings me to my last point just before I sit down. How does he do it? If you tonight are blinded in your sin, blinded by the devil, heading to where the devil will be, a place never meant for you, but a place that was meant for him, hell. And if you have no power to remove the blinders yourself, you're not stronger than the devil. And if there's one who is stronger, the Lord, how can he remove your blinders? How can you come to see? The same way the devil keeps the people blind, unbelief. The opposite. It's the same way the blinders come off. Faith. Faith. What did Bartimaeus, that blind man in Jericho, what did he do? Jesus is passing this way, Bartimaeus. Lord, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And through simple, childlike faith, the blinders are gone. He can see. What do you need to believe, my friend? You need to believe that you, as you look in the mirror as, actually, as who you actually are, as who the Bible portrays you to be, you are a sinner before God. You have sinned against the Lord. You have broken his law. You need to face what the Bible says, that the penalty for that sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. And then you need to hear what the Bible says. That Christ died for sinners. That Christ died for the ungodly. That God sent his son into this world, not to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, that he went to the cross, and all the penalty for sin, all the death penalty was placed on him and exhausted on him. He suffered for it. He suffered enough. He said at the end, it's finished. And on the third day, he was raised again, God satisfied with Jesus Christ. And a person, at the moment, a person places their faith in what the Lord Jesus has done, and who he is based on God's word, just like they're blinded by not believing. The blinders come off the moment they believe. I can tell you that's what happened to me. The reason I love this subject is because it's very close to what happened to me. I was blind. Yes, I grew up in a Christian home. Yes, my mom and dad were Christians, and we went to gospel meetings like this, whether I liked it or not. And I heard the gospel from a very young age, and I never thought I was blind, you see. I mean, I would have said it. If someone was up here having a Sunday school and they said, 
what are you? Bartimaeus was blind. Are you blind? I was, yep, I'm blind. Sure, I, I would have said it. I, I knew how to tick the list and everything, but I didn't really think I was blind. I was more of a partial case, you know. I was more of a slightly blind. Because you see, I had all the verses. I had all the process that I could just go through and then blinders come off. I remember the day. I remember the day where I tried to take the blinders off and I could not do it. I remember the darkness of not like something I, I saw or, or anything like that, but just the darkness of not being able to bring the light in to see. I read John 3 16 and everyone else said, put your name in it and you'll see for God so loved Joseph Baker. And I was blind, blind. And as I fell across my bed for the first time in my life, I acknowledged before God that I actually am blind. That I actually can't see it. I, I don't know how to be saved. And I came as a blind beggar to the Lord. I took the blinders off. He gave me a word, but he was wounded for your sins. You know what I did? I believed it. And I could see. I opened John 3 16 the next morning. I didn't have to put my name in it was there. He loved me. He gave himself for me. All the Bible all of a sudden. I know that's not quite correct to say, but nearly the next day, the whole Bible was about me. Every verse, he died for me. He loved me. He's coming for me. I know he's coming for others, but Fred, he's coming for me. I'm going to see him, the man who gave me sight. And that's why we sang that tonight. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's blind. But now I see. What an amazing thing to be able to see. You know, friend, if I could just convince you of this just before Mr. Higgins comes up here and preaches the gospel. In some small measure, we are here out of love for your soul. Perhaps these gospel meetings are an annoyance to you or an irritation. But, but, but please understand, we are here out of love for your soul and representing a God who loves you far more than you do. You know, uh, just before I left here to uh, New Jersey, in a city not too far from where I live, the city of Grand Rapids, there was a woman who was woken up by a newspaper man. What time do you like to wake up? Seven? Seven, okay. She was woken up at 4.30 in the morning. This newspaper men get up that early maybe, but he knocked on her door. She came to the door, said, your garage is on fire. 4.30 in the morning. She said she grabbed her partner and their child, their 18 month old child, and they just ran with nothing out of the door. The flames were coming through. There's video footage that is just honestly, it, it would, it's just shocking to see as they get out of there, 4.30. At 4.55, the flames are going right through the garage and the firefighters are assembled and they're radioing over. There's a fire in this garage here in Grand Rapids and it seems like the situation is under control. The firemen are coming. Unbeknownst to the firefighters, unbeknownst to police officers, unbeknownst to anyone there, there was a propane tank in that garage. And at 4.55, there was a noise that would cause you to shriek, that would send goosebumps as that whole house just exploded. There was one man who saw a fire, a newspaper man, just a delivery man. There was a woman, her husband, her little infant child who didn't see it. They were blind to it. How much you want to bet? She thanks God for that man. Who woke her up? Great annoyance. 4, 4, 4 30 in the morning. Before in 25 minutes, an explosion destroyed her house. It doesn't take too much imagination for a gospel preacher because the guy who did it was a newspaper man, a message deliverer. And guess what the woman's name was?
you could have the blinders off. You don't anymore have to be the devil's slave. Tonight in this tent, you could come to see by just resting on the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins according to the scripture, and satisfied God for the whole matter. You do that tonight, even as the meeting continues, you will see. Now, my brother, Mr. Baker, has been emphasizing what it means to be lost. I would like to emphasize the word saved. Acts 16, please. <laughs> the book of Acts and chapter 16. Paul and Silas have been beaten and imprisoned. For preaching the gospel, and we'll just break into the narrative at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, and remember now, legally, he's responsible. He will pay with his life if prisoners have escaped. So he wakes up, seeing the prison doors open. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling. And that is trembling for fear. And he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, please listen to this next verse. This makes salvation crystal clear. And they said, as if in glad unison, they both said the same thing at the same time. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I pass. This morning, somebody sent me, a friend of mine sent me an email. Uh, this was an, not exactly what it said, but this is a good, uh, a reasonable facsimile. It said, never use a big word when a diminutive terminology of specific etymology serves as a sufficient vehicle for communicating an otherwise arcane concept. You know what I love about the gospel of all other things? It's such a simple message. The man says, what must I do to be saved? And their answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It doesn't get much simpler than that. And I am hoping that after the solemn preaching and stirring preaching to which you have listened, that just now in your heart is the question that was in this man's heart. What must I do to be saved? Please don't raise your hand, but I so much hope there's somebody in the tent tonight. And right now what you are thinking is I would love to be saved tonight how can i get it i want you to think first of all about what it means to be saved i think that apart from the names and titles of the triune god that are in the bible that this is the bible's greatest word saved god used the word didn't he he said look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for i am god and there is none else the holy spirit used the word didn't he he said, the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. The Lord Jesus used that word, didn't he? I came not to destroy the world, but to save the world. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He said, the son of man, speaking of himself, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Angels use this word. The angel said, call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. Peter used this word in preaching. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. James used this word. Writing to the Christians, he said, it is the word of God. The word of God that is able to save souls. And of course, John used this word. Pointing us on to the future and telling us about that wonderful heavenly city. And he said, the nations of those who are saved shall walk in the light of it. This word is God's way of describing the highest 
good that can come to a human being, the ultimate blessing that can come to you. There's nothing to compare with this. If you left this meeting tonight and you were saved, it wouldn't matter what else you didn't have in life. If you left this meeting tonight and your soul was saved, it wouldn't matter what else in life you lost. Conversely, no matter what else you gained, if you do not have salvation, you will be a pauper for eternity. This is God's ultimate blessing for a human being. Suppose you have had a relative, a spouse, children, grandchildren on a flight. And you thought to yourself how dangerous sometimes flying can be. And you prayed for their safe arrival. And the plane landed. They were safe. And you thank God that they arrived safely. But really, you, you wouldn't exactly say they were saved, would you? They were preserved from an accident, but they weren't saved. Why? Because there was no element of danger. So when God uses this word, he's reminding us of the menace, the peril, the danger in which men and women are. Think of a fireman saving somebody from a burning building. Think of a lifeguard knifing through the water and grabbing that person before he goes down for the third time. Think of a rescue team going down into the mine to bring up miners that would have died down there. And, and those are some of the pictures that remind us of what God means when he speaks about saving a human being from sin in this life and from its dread consequences in the next life. Are you saved? Because you are in great danger. Beneath your feet tonight is a real hell. I know that because the Lord Jesus said that. It's not something I want to be true. If there was a truth in the Bible that I could actually change and properly do so, that would be the one. I don't want people to go to hell. God doesn't want people to go to hell. But my friend, if you pursue a life of sin, if you continue remaining blind, if you go on down the broad way, one day you will die and you will plummet down into the awful abyss of hell and you will perish forever. And God wants to save you. The word has the idea also of delivering something from misuse. For instance, a penny saved is a penny earned. What does that mean? It means, it means that you would use coupons and you would save so much money at the store. So a penny saved means you didn't waste it. You didn't misuse it. It's there. You've regained or kept its value and it can be used in the future. Do you know when God saves a person, he saves that person's value, what it is as a human being, which is why the Lord Jesus used the picture of losing and gaining. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Do you remember the woman in Luke 15 who found the one lost coin and now it was saved? What does that mean? Now its value could be used. No, I'm not going to use it as a personal reference. As thankful to God as I am that I'm saved. But I think of people whom God has saved. And whatever has been in their life that has been a help to other people, it is because God saved them. I might be looking into the eyes of someone who could be a wonderful gospel preacher. I might be looking into the eyes of, of, of a young woman here who could be a wonderful servant of God. But that will completely be lost if you continue in your sins. See, to be saved is to secure something from being lost. So we say to someone, would you please save this seat for me? I'll be right back. Would you save my place in line, please? See, you're, you're saving something from being lost. To be saved in the Bible sense of the word is to be secured from perishing and saved for heaven. I'm not sure that any of us, and I'm not sure even that if I weren't aware of this, reading about it once more again today, that I would recognize the name Ernst von Bressendorf. But he was the man who got the command directly from Adolf Hitler to detonate the explosions, to give the command to detonate the explosions that had been placed all around the city of Paris. Hitler had fumed in his fury and said that Paris will only fall into the hands of the enemy as a field of rubble. There were explosives planted at the Eiffel Tower. There were explosives planted at the Elysee Palace. 
There were explosives planted on all the bridges around Paris. There were explosives planted to create a firestorm that would spread throughout the city so that not just landmarks would be destroyed, but that the entire city would be destroyed. Ressendorf understood if he failed to carry out the command, he would be executed. So he delayed passing it on. And he delayed until it was obvious to the man that was responsible, a Prussian who would have followed the command to the letter, until it was obvious even to that man that the city was going to the Allies and they needed to escape. And so Ernst von Ressendorf was called the man who saved Paris. It was going to be destroyed and he saved it. I was going to be destroyed in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And the Jesus who died on the cross died to save me. He delivered me, he saved me. Now that is what, what it means to be saved. Of course, what we've heard at the beginning and what I've just told you is why we need to be saved. There is a peril that you face. You could die any moment. And if you cross the line into eternity, there are no second chances. There is no further opportunity. There are no gospel preachers in eternity preaching about how to be saved. Trust the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Paul and Silas can do it in a prison, but they're not preaching in paradise and telling people up there about salvation. They're telling them about the grace that saved them. So if you died, where would you be? If, if, if Mr. Baker or I were to put into your hand the piece of paper that Mr. McVean put into mine and told me to fill it out. If we were to put that into your hand tonight, if I die tonight, my soul will be in and you had to fill in the blank line. Please, in the name of my God, would you just answer that quietly in your own mind? If you die tonight, where would you be? That is why you need to be saved. You've been reminded of the power that is at work. Sin operates in our life. It robs us of a relationship with God. It has created a gaping hole, void in our minds and hearts that nothing in this world can fill. It predisposes us to listen to lies instead of to the truth. It gives us a bias toward cooperating with the devil instead of listening to God and trusting Christ. You say, no, I, 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 would, I would never do that. I would never be like that. How many times have you heard the gospel and never trusted Christ? Just add them up and think of all the times that God, the Holy Spirit, has tried to bring you to the Lord Jesus. And you have listened to the devil whisper to you, not, not, not tonight, not, not now, later. Because there's a power working in your life. And of course, all of well, that brings us to this awful possibility. You could die in your sins. Millions have. The Spirit of God has inspired the Word of God. The Son of God came and died on a cross. God's love embraces the entire world. The gospel is being offered to every human being. And yet right now there are countless souls on the broad road going to hell. And you may be one of them. And that is why you need to be saved. Now, how is it that they can give him such a simple answer to such a profound issue to be saved for eternity? This is who made it possible for us to be saved. God designed the plan. He, to use Old Testament language, he devised means. No one could have thought to suggest this to God. If, if, it, if it were not in God's heart, please tell me, do you think any of us could have said to God, we need to be saved. Would you consider allowing your son to be murdered? No, no. God devised this plan. And again, to use the words of that wise woman of Tekoa, God devised means so that his banished would not be expelled from him forever. It is the gospel of God because it is God who devised this. This is his way to be saved or to use the terminology. This is his plan of salvation. That lost sinners become saved by trusting Christ as their savior. Just allow me to give you the words of a veteran gospel preacher from the, eighth, from the 19th century. This is what he wrote. 
My sins were the scourges which lacerated those blessed shoulders and crowned with thorn those bleeding brows. My sins cried, crucify him, crucify him, and laid the cross upon his gracious shoulders. His being led forth to die is sorrow enough for one eternity. But my having been his murderer is more, infinitely more grief than one poor fountain of tears can express. That is a man who understood that Christ died for his sins. This is how God can save you. It is Christ who provided the way. That is why it's called the gospel of Christ. His death has opened up the way to God. It has actually allowed God to save people without lowering his standard. It has given God a way to save sinners righteously or to use the remarkable language of Romans chapter four. It has given God the capability of justifying the guilty, the ungodly. There's no court in the world that can do that. But because of what Christ did at Calvary, God could take you tonight, a guilty sinner, and clear you of every charge, even though you're guilty. And all of that is because of what Christ did on the cross. And then the Holy Spirit inspired the record so that here we have it right now. See, apart from this book, I would never have known what Jesus did for me. Apart, apart from this book, I would never have known what he accomplished on the cross. Do you remember the Passover night, that first Passover? And Israelis took lambs and killed the lambs, and then they, they caught the blood in a basin. And they brought the basin to the threshold of their houses. And they pulled up just grass, a common weed called hyssop. And they dipped it in the basin of blood, and then they applied the blood to their doors. Now that lamb points us to the lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. And that blood points us to the blood that he shed on the cross. And that basin points us to the word of God. The basin caught the blood and made it available to them when they needed it. This marvelous, glorious, wonderful, incomparable book captured the value of what the Lord Jesus did on the cross and made it available to me on that night in 1966 when I was lost and blind and had no idea how to be saved. And then there it was. This book was telling me what Christ had done for me. This book was presenting him as the savior. This book was telling me he would save me if I would trust him. I would have had no way of knowing that if it weren't for this book. And this book is presenting this savior to you in these golden words. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved because Christ has made it possible. So then how, how can we be saved? Now there are two cautions that I want to bring to your attention. First, be sure you are asking the right question and then be sure that you get the correct answer. The wrong question, the question not to ask is, what must I do to feel safe? That's the wrong question. Your feelings are not dependable. They are unreliable. Saul of Tarsus said, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And his thoughts were all wrong. There's a man in the Old Testament named Naaman who said, I, I thought the prophet would come out and wave his hand over the leprosy and pronounce me clean. His thoughts were all wrong. My thoughts were all wrong. I couldn't begin to count how many testimonies I listened to as people told how they were saved. And I cobbled it all together, borrowing a little from here and a little from there. And I pieced it all together. And I had a Rube Goldberg, Goldberg kind of salvation all built up that you do this, you say this, you, you get to this point, you admit this. You get a wonderful feeling. You feel your burden roll away and suddenly you're saved. There's a man in Acts chapter eight and his thoughts were all wrong about salvation. Peter had to say to him, you thought you could buy the gift of God with money? My thoughts were wrong. Perhaps your thoughts are wrong. So please don't ask, what must I do to be saved? You see, what is dependable? What is reliable? What is unimpeachable? Is the word of God. 
The only reason I know I was going to hell is because the Bible told me. I've never seen hell in my life. The only reason I know I'm going to heaven tonight is because the Bible tells me. I'm not sure I've ever felt saved a day in my life. But you see, what the Bible told me more than half a century ago, it tells me tonight. The Lord Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Peter wrote, the word of our God will stand forever. And when a person rests on the word of God, then he rests, he rests on something that will never change. He is now on a rock that will never shift. It is the impregnable, immovable rock of God's word. And you can depend on God and his word tonight. But it is also not what must I do to save myself. It is very possible that the, that the jailer was not saved the moment he heard these words, but was saved in the gospel meeting that followed. And what a gospel meeting it was. The whole family saved. The whole family saved. They spoke to him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. You see how often an anxious soul approaches the subject of salvation with this in his or her mind. What, what is this one small little thing God wants me to do? And I'm sure that once I do it, if I do it right, I will be saved. Now, you could turn around and say to me, well, it says right there, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that something I have to do? Yes, but as long as you think that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is a great work that you have to do to add to what he did, you will never be saved. But if you come tonight as a blind, helpless sinner, as we've been hearing, and just simply rest on what God says, he will save you. Because the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So look at their answer, please, as I close. Did you notice the direction, the direction of their answer? Where do they point him? They point him to the Lord Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Do you notice the Bible never tells you to believe on the Holy Spirit? The Bible never tells you that if you want to be saved, believe on God the Father. Why does it invariably, constantly, unchangeably point lost sinners to the Lord Jesus? Because it was not God the Father, and it was not God the Holy Spirit, but it was God the Son who died for sinners at Calvary. That is what makes him the Savior. That is why tonight, if you believe on him, you will be saved. Because it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He delivers from that awful power, that blinding power that plunges a sinner into darkness mentally and confuses him as to the gospel. If somebody asks you to how to be saved, what would your answer be? How complex, how, how abstruse would your answer be? Theirs was very simple, wasn't it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There was a great gospel preacher some years ago. His name was Sam McEwen. He lived in Virginia and he was visiting in a prison where a man was on death row, slated to be executed. What do you tell a man like that? He can't join a church. He can't be baptized. He has no money to give. What do you tell a man like that who wants to be right with God? Mr. McEwen told him about the Lord Jesus. Mr. McEwen told him about Christ who died for him. Mr. McEwen pointed him to the Savior, just like these two preachers did. And when the day came that he was to die. He was asked for one request. What was it? And he said, I want Mr. McEwen to escort me to the chamber. So Mr. McEwen went into the prison. Took that long walk. Said goodbye to him. And watched while they took him into the room and strapped him into the electric chair. That's what they were using back then. And he said, once they got him in and they strapped him in, the man turned his face to the wall and he said, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. What do you tell a dying sinner? What religion would you point him to? 
What works would you say he needed to accomplish in his last moments? What rites or rituals would you want to put him through in order to see him saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You do that tonight. Christ will save you. So I have said that their answer is crystal clear. So let me just close by telling you that the situation tonight is crystal clear. Remain blind. You could lose your soul tonight. Trust Christ as your savior. And he will save you. Let me repeat that. Trust Christ tonight. And he will save you. No hesitation. Him that comes to me, he said, I will in no wise cast out. No matter who you are, no matter how many times you've turned from him, if you will turn to him tonight, he will save you.